Hello again, it's me, Madame Macabre. For a while now, people have been asking me to share some of my own personal creepy experiences, and I think it's finally time for a story. The following is completely true, and is my perspective of a shared experience with my old friend Shadow Kisses. It is with her permission that I share this highly personal story. During my senior year of high school, I went through a sort of disconnect with many of my friends. I was participating in a program where I took all of my courses at the local college instead of the high school, and didn't really get the chance to see them as much as I had in the past. I think this played a role in my lack of perceptiveness with the changes that were overtaking my best friend Shadow Kisses at that time. To give you some context, that year was a big time of change for her, and not the good kind. Her parents had just begun the process of filing for divorce, and she, as many children do, blamed herself. Her mother and sister had already moved out, leaving just her and her father alone in the big house. There was a lot of tension there, and her father would often verbally vent his frustration on her, only amplifying her feelings of guilt and sorrow. All of this stress was furthermore compounded by her difficult school load. Similar to me, she was also in a special program. However, instead of taking college courses, she focused on the culinary trade. She truly had a passion for the culinary arts, but the stress from home did not sit well with the high-stress kitchen environment in which she had recently been made sous chef. As you probably guessed it, which is laden with even more stress. Essentially put, she wasn't doing too hot. It was in this environment of miserable, dark energy that things started to get... scary. Mind you, at the time, I personally had no knowledge of the events I am about to tell you. I was off at my different campus, not seeing her nearly as much, and she was afraid that I wouldn't believe her and might push her away if she told me. So, I only learned of these events after the crescendo of this nightmare. But looking back in hindsight, this explains so much of her odd behavior. As far as my personal beliefs go, I think all of the nastiness in her life left her vulnerable, and in her weakness, something attached itself to her. If you subscribe to the stages theory, this would have been the moment of manifestation, which rapidly escalated into infestation over a few short weeks. It started out pretty small, bad feelings, cold patches, nothing to immediately cause a rational person to raise the alarm. But it didn't go away. It got worse. Bigger, nastier, more noticeable. There reached a point where she could no longer be inside her home anymore without feeling as though something malicious was watching her at all times. Things scratched her walls in the night, something knocked on her second-story bedroom window while she tried to sleep, and things were still yet to get worse, so much worse. It was one morning, while she was getting ready for school, that the stone that created the ripple effect was thrown. She was quite used to getting up early for school, 3 a.m. early. Being sous chef of a functional kitchen, she was responsible for opening the kitchen to serve breakfast to the cafeteria of hungry college students. Her father didn't usually get up until 6, so it was no wonder she was surprised by the presence of another that morning. As she sleepily made her way through the family kitchen to get some coffee to start the day, she was startled to see a hand curl around the doorway to the dining room ahead. She started to call out to who she thought was her father, but then immediately noticed something was wrong when she took a closer look at the long, bony, deathly white, gnarled fingers she did not recognize. She froze in place as a head and shoulders slowly pulled into view. What was staring at her with its wide, unblinking eyes was what appeared very similarly to Kayako from The Grudge. 
pale, waxy skin, long black hair, and a gaping mouth and eyes. She recoiled in terror and ran upstairs to wake her father. Thinking it was an intruder, he ran down the stairs to find no one else in the home. He then shouted at her for waking him, calling her crazy and accusing her of using drugs. As you can imagine, this further shook her mental state and only worsened the overwhelming dread Shadow Kisses was fighting. On top of her guilt and sadness, she now was questioning her sanity. I must step in once more with my own observations. See, I find it interesting that whatever it was chose to show itself in the form of the grudge, seeing as the movie was still pretty recent during this period of time, and it absolutely terrified her. Interesting that something bent on tormenting her should choose to take the form of her greatest fear at that time. But I digress. Things continued to amplify from this point. These things continued happening over the course of several weeks, and it had begun to take its toll on her. Somewhere along the line, I believe it moved from infestation to oppression. While I personally didn't know of these things she was experiencing at the time, I did notice big changes in her personality. Her normal, spunky sense of humor had dimmed, and she seemed so very tired. She was also very forgetful, it seemed. There would be large spans of time where she wouldn't be able to recall anything at all. And her anger. Her anger that came out of nowhere and surged with such unnatural intensity. Something was definitely up with her, but she wouldn't talk to me and I was afraid to push. Perhaps the strangest thing I witnessed at the time was a fight she got into with her father. I was over at her house and while we were downstairs, he asked her if she could do the dishes. Now normally, while not enthused, she would have had no problem, but for some reason, at that time, she became completely enraged. She started screaming wildly and acting completely irrational and aggressive toward him. When she had finally calmed down and we had gone upstairs, I asked her if she was alright because of her strange behavior, and she looked at me strangely. She couldn't remember anything that had just happened. Like, that entire moment of the day was just ripped from her thoughts. And still, things continued to worsen. She began dreading returning home. She did not want to be inside that home, and every time she entered, she would immediately start feeling overcome with negative emotions. Because of this, she was looking for more and more excuses to stay late at school. But soon, even school would no longer be a safe haven for her. It was one day that Shadow Kisses was serving breakfast, as usual, that she started to get that familiar, nasty feeling. It was strange because up until that point, she had been feeling fine at school. She tried to ignore this and continued to serve orders to the window. And it was at this point that her blood ran cold. Staring out across the cafeteria, back facing her at the farthest table, was what she immediately recognized as the thing that had crept around the dining room doorway. Though she could not see its face, its battered dress and long, tangled black hair stuck out clearly to her. Half hoping and half fearing that she was suffering from a mental break, she forced herself to turn away and get to work on another order. She just managed to calm herself down with rational talk when she approached the window again with the next order. At this, she could no longer write it off. Once again, the thing was there, its back still facing her. But this time, it was one table closer to the window. Panic was rising, but she didn't know what she could do. She still had a stack of orders to complete, and though her gut told her to run, she didn't want to let her chef down over what she still wasn't sure was real or just a frantic hallucination. So she continued to place orders, and it continued to get closer. It was with unimaginable dread when she placed her last order that she spotted it at the table closest to the window, no more than ten feet away. 
Fortunately, at this point, more students arrived in the kitchen, and when she turned back to steal one more glance, it was gone. Though it did not appear again the rest of the day, she couldn't drop the growing sense of hopelessness that had attached itself to her. She may have fully subscribed to the idea that it was all in her head, if it were not for what her father experienced. You see, later that day when she arrived home from school, he charged to meet her at the door and began yelling at her. He screamed that her schooling cost way too much for her to skip out on it, and he wouldn't have any more of it. This obviously confused her, seeing as she had just spent the whole day at school. She told him so, and he called her a liar. He said that when he was leaving for work, he saw her in the dining room, sitting facing the corner. He said he shouted at her, but she didn't respond, and he was already nearly late for work, so he stormed off, vowing to give her a talking to that evening. The news of this added another knot to her already sinking stomach. She tried to remain calm while explaining to her father what he saw couldn't have been her as she was at school all day. She even implored him to call her chef to verify. And he did. One quick phone call to the school later, he sat silent for a moment. Seeing this as her chance to finally have an ally against whatever it was, she tried explaining to her father. She told him that something bad was in the house. It had been tormenting her, and now even he had seen it. She begged him to call the church and bring a pastor in to bless the house, but he violently shot that down, saying they weren't going to do that because of some deranged fantasy of hers. He then recanted his statement about seeing her in the dining room, using some weak excuse about having had a few beers the night before, so he must have still been a bit drunk the following morning, and it was nothing. This was probably the lowest time for her. She felt completely alone and powerless to do anything about it. Perhaps this is why things escalated so quickly the next day. After returning home from school, she found that her father was out at a bar after work, so she was home alone. Trying her best to stay calm, she went into the den to watch television. The den was on the first floor, located directly beneath her bedroom. It was probably about 10 o'clock p.m. when it started. She nearly jumped out of her skin when she heard the sound of something walking, very quickly, in circles in her bedroom above. Terrified, but disheartened by her father's insistence that she was hallucinating, she tried to ignore it. It was at this point that the footsteps became viciously loud, as though something were stomping with all its might around her room, but at an unnaturally fast pace. Scared, but determined to confront her hallucinations, she slowly worked her way up the stairs. It was at this point that the stomping came to a halt. She silently passed her parents' bedroom and came to a stop outside of her own door. She took a deep breath and pushed it open. To her relief, there was nothing there. She stepped in and began looking around. Although still frightened, she was hopeful that whatever it was had left. But it was as she stood in the middle of her room that the books on her shelf began carefully and deliberately dislodging themselves and falling to the floor. Not a violent cascade of books, mind you, just one at a time, slowly pushing out until they tumbled to the floor. One at a time, in order. This was the breaking point. She fled down the stairs and out onto the porch in nothing but her pajamas and bare feet. That's when I got the call. It was near 11 o'clock p.m. and I had just started getting ready for bed. As it was a school night, I answered the phone to a hysterical shout of kisses. She tried recounting her terror, but she was so upset I could barely understand anything. All I could make out from the call was she was very upset and refused to go back inside of her house. But that was enough for me. I told my dad that something bad was going on at her place, and I was going to bring her over to our house for the night to get her out of whatever was happening. Without a moment of hesitation, he agreed, and I was on my way. This is where my personal account begins. When I first pulled up to her house, I saw my best friend huddled over shivering on her porch. 
I was shocked to see her without a coat or even shoes. We live in Washington, and our autumn nights are frigidly cold. Whatever had caused her to leave the house in that condition really had to have shaken her. It was by this point that she had calmed down enough to recount what had just happened. Mind you, I'm a very open-minded individual, and I'm inclined to believe in the possibility of many things. But, first and foremost, I will always look at a situation through the lens of a skeptic, attempting to find a scientific explanation first. Something I inherited from my father, I suppose. While I didn't dare tell her that what she encountered was not what she thought she experienced, I was certain I could find a cause. Mind you, at this point in time, I had no context. I did not know what I previously told you about the weeks prior she had suffered. I just got a call in the dark about hearing footsteps in her house, and I wanted to investigate. I told her that I believed she had experienced something, but I wanted to check it out for myself, and that she needed to go back in with me because she needed to pack some things for overnight. This took a moment of convincing, because I cannot stress enough how much she did not want to go back into that house. But eventually she did agree to go if I didn't leave her. So I would led the way and opened the door. I couldn't tell her this at the time, given how weak her will already was, but when I crossed the threshold into that house, I immediately wanted to leave. I don't know if you believe in a sixth sense or some deep, buried instinct that humans retain from a much more dangerous time, but something in my core told me to run. It was like walking into a brick wall of intense, negative energy and dread. But for her sake, I retained a solid facade. It wasn't until she stepped in behind me and began rebuilding her own resolve that things truly got worse. The moment she closed the door behind us, we both heard the sound of heavy footfalls stomping from the front hallway back through the kitchen and into the dining room. She nearly disintegrated into a mess right there, but I immediately became enraged. To this day, I'm not sure why. I should have been scared witless, and if this were happening to me and in my home, I probably would have been. But it was happening to my best friend, and my immediate response was outrage at whatever was putting her in that distressed state. So seconds after the stomping started, I tore after it. I hit every single light switch on my tirade through the first floor. By the time I was finished, I was unnaturally livid and had not located the source of my rage, and every single light on the ground level was blaring. At this point, I stormed back to the foyer where Shadow Kisses had been waiting and shouted that we were going upstairs, packing her things, and getting the hell out. It was when we were preparing to head up the stairs that, again, we both experienced something. Leaning over the banister, staring at us, was what I can only describe as a shadow person. Again, fueled by my strange rage, I didn't hesitate in charging up the stairs into the darkness above. As I was pounding up the stairs, it moved with incredible speed and slipped into her parents' bedroom. I hit the lights and pulled their bedroom door shut, deciding to leave whatever it was in there because I was growing tired of its games. I chose not to tell her that it had gone into that room, because she was already upset enough and I wasn't sure what more she could handle. I called to her that the lights were on and that she could come up and pack. Not wanting to be alone downstairs, she tore up after me. Let me tell you, I have never seen that woman pack for anything as quickly as she packed that night. She closed the door to her room behind her because it gave her some sort of comfort. So when we opened the door again, and I saw the door to her parents' room slightly ajar, it filled me with unimaginable dread. However, once again, I couldn't mention this to her. At this point, my fear was that it was perhaps someone who had broken in, but I was having a hard time figuring out how they could have gotten from the dining room to the top of the banister without having to pass in front of either her or me. Instead of focusing on this, I just ushered Shadow Kisses to follow me back out and on our way. But 
what awaited us next seriously shook my own resolve. Despite having physically turned on every light on the first floor, it was complete blackness. At this, shadow kisses began melting down, and I felt myself growing angry once more. I stormed down, throwing the switch for the foyer light once more, and raced to the hallway ahead. I didn't bother hitting the lights this time, as the light from the foyer reached pretty far down the hall. On my way down, I spotted one of those heavy old Bibles on a shelf, so I scooped it up and continued my charge. There were no footsteps, no strange sounds, but something told me to turn toward the den. That's when I saw it. Even though it was dim, the light from the foyer still faintly illuminated the den. I should have been able to see details and features, like how I could see the furniture in the room. But I couldn't. I stared through the doorway of the room, and from the far end of the room, it stared back. What I saw was what appeared to once again be a shadow person. It was the deepest pitch black I have ever seen. No features, no eyes, simply a solid black mass in the silhouette of a very large man. It stood in a strange, aggressive posture, its shoulders thrown back and its arms spread at its side. In the split second that I stood there, I launched the heavy old Bible straight at it. This moment seemed to break whatever stare down we were having, because in that moment, there was no longer a figure there. The Bible crashed against the wall, and I hit the light, revealing an empty room. Yes, I threw a Bible at it. Don't ask me why, it was an impulse. This has lived on to be a terrible joke between Shadow Kisses and I. Sensing that whatever imminent danger had been at hand was now elsewhere, likely regrouping for its next assault, I ran back to the front of the house. Shadow Kisses gladly ran through the front door, and following after her, I felt an indescribable feeling of relief and comfort as I exited the threshold once more. Quickly, we loaded her bags into my car, hopped in, and then began tearing out of the driveway. As I was focused on shifting from reverse to drive, I heard Shadow Kisses utter a scream as she looked up at the house. Rather than waste another moment trying to steal a glance myself, I floored it and roared out of there. She later explained to me that while looking up to the house, she saw that grudge thing again, but this time it was looking at her through the top window at the very front of her house. While this alone was scary enough, she told me that the real reason it truly upset her was because that window was not functional. It was a skylight put in the highest point above the stairwell, with no way to access it without a ladder. After arriving back home, I found my father still awake and waiting for us. Not wanting to wake my mother, we sat in the living room at the front of the house. There, we explained everything that had just occurred in that house. Fortunately, my father is a very open-minded man. He is deeply faithful, so at the mention of anything possibly demonic, as I now believe this experience to have been, he is inclined to take you seriously. Of course, as I mentioned, I get my skeptical nature from him, so he'll always be calculating possible scientific explanations, but the important difference is that while doing so, he will also be preemptive and treat the situation as a very real danger at the same time until he can figure it out. He led us in a few prayers and eventually Shadow Kisses calmed down and we were able to get some rest. She later told me that that was the first night in weeks she had been able to get a full night's rest, and that it was the first time she truly felt safe. Though it did shake me a little when she told me that during my father's prayers, she could see through the partially open blinds of our window what looked like the pale, bruised legs of the thing just standing there, watching, as though it knew she was in there but had no power to enter that home. I'm happy to say that things got better for her from there. She stayed with me and my family for two more days, and then immediately moved in with her grandmother, another ferociously faithful individual. As Shadow Kisses began to heal, 
I believed that she was no longer vulnerable enough to be preyed upon by whatever malicious entity that thing was. From my personal understanding of demons, they tend to be cowardly creatures that feed upon those who are most weak and unable to protect themselves. And given the condition Shadow Kisses was at that period of time, between her parents' divorce, her self-loathing, and her stressful, isolated school life, she was an ideal target. But she is strong now, and she hasn't encountered that thing for over six years. A happy ending well deserved. As for whatever that thing was, I'm fairly certain it remembered me and was furious at me for interfering. I had my own encounter a year later while away at college with what I'm sure was the same entity. Fortunately, I overcame it once more and haven't encountered it again in these past five years. But that's another story. Perhaps one I'll share with you a little later on. Until then, stay safe, my friends. It can be a scary world. <laughs>